Aloha friends, it's Robert Selleck. Welcome to season two of the Blue Planet Show. On this show, I interview wing foil enthusiasts, athletes, designers, thought leaders, and go into great detail on technique, equipment, but also try to find out a little bit more about the person, what inspires them, and how they live their best life. You can watch it right here on YouTube. For those of you who are visual learners like myself, that's really helpful to have that visual content. But of course, you can also listen to it as a podcast on your favorite podcast app. Just look for the Blue Planet Show. In this interview with Alan Cadiz, we start with very basic beginner tips, the top five tips for beginners, and then we get into much more advanced stuff as well. So there's something here for everybody. And we also talk about equipment, including what Alan used in the recent race on Maui that he actually won against uh, other wingers that were less than a third of his age. So uh, nice work, Alan, on that. I really hope you enjoy this interview. If you do, please remember to give it a thumbs up here on YouTube. Subscribe to the Blue Planet Surf YouTube channel. And without further ado, here is Alan Cadiz. Okay, Alan, welcome to the Blue Planet Show. Welcome back to the Blue Planet Show. Thank you, you Robert. Can't... Thank you for inviting me back. Yeah, so we, we had a great interview last year, and it was one of them. Actually, it was the most popular video on the Blue Planet Show we, and with almost 40,000 views on YouTube and then a lot of wow. listens on the podcast as well. So, wow. um, you know, you, you always have great information. People love to hear about it. So that's great to have you back on the show. And I uh, just wanted to kind of catch up and see what happened over the last year. So so what's new or what, what what's the latest and greatest that's going on on Maui? Uh, well, it's during the last year, it's just been more, more winging. We've had consistent wind all year. Um, winging is, is growing in popularity. Uh, it's still been kind of quiet, you know, with COVID winding down. It's not, not as many people as, as in the past, but uh, we just had our first uh, competitive event in three years. And uh, what else is new? Mm. That's cool. Yeah, we're, we're going to get into that more later that I want to definitely hear about that Patagonia um, Kite and Wing Festival. But um, to get started, like last last year, I usually ask kind of all the more advanced questions first that I was interested in hearing about. And then at the end, I asked the guests to, to talk a little bit about beginner tips. But today, um, I want to kind of turn it around the other way, start with the beginner stuff and then kind of work up to more advanced things. Because I figure that most people that are really into winging are going to watch till the end or listen to the end. And the beginners, we got to get them into it right in the beginning. So I asked you to, to come up with your top five tips for beginners uh, to get into wing foiling. So, and you not only uh, prepared some answers, but you even made a little video from what I understand. So, so let's start with that. What are your top five tips for beginners? All right, well, thank you. Yes, I, I was thinking about those tips and there's, there's so many different things. Um, but I tried to think about the key things and I put together a little timeline video here, tip number one. And I, I just pulled these clips out of my inventory of clips and start on a big board. Now this is a windsurf board. We have a surplus of windsurf boards here on Maui. Uh, you, can, you might think a SUP board would be a good substitute, but you really need the dagger board unless you can put strap-on fins on your SUP board. I don't recommend using the SUP board. It really needs to have something with the dagger board. And I recommend this for people who are just learning how to use the wing, just to learn the basics. Um, you can learn on a SUP board, I, uh, I mean a foil board, but I recommend a large foil board to start with. Uh, here I've got Frank uh, uh, Muppe, Muppe here. He's a very skilled rider and using a smaller board, it's challenging. So as a beginner, if you're on a smaller board, it's pretty tough to get going. And you know, in the extreme case, a really small board 
it has its advantages, but it's tough to get up on the smaller boards. And this, this is, goes through the whole spectrum. So as a beginner, you really want to have a floaty board. It's just more challenging to get up. Uh, there are advantages to the tiny board once you're up, uh, but in the learning stages, you really want to have a floaty board. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So that's tip number one. So not everyone has access to the big boards on, and it doesn't, because the learning curve is so fast, it doesn't always make sense to buy a big board. I mean, maybe for some, they've got a big family or they've got a slow learning curve or they're sailing in, in light wind. Uh, but if they have the option to rent, on, I would encourage that for the first you know, few runs. On a mistake that a lot of people make is they'll, they'll run out and buy the board that they think they're gonna end up on, you know, maybe an 80, 80 liter board. And it's a real struggle to learn on those smaller boards. You can do it, but it just takes a lot longer. So if you have access to a bigger board, uh, take advantage of it. Yeah, very good. And then I just wanted to mention too, if, um, for people that have an old stand-up board or something, a big floaty stand-up board, there is a kind of a stick on center fin dagger board available from Slingshot, I believe, that you yes. can basically glue onto the bottom of your board and kind of make, if your board doesn't have a dagger board. And that makes a big difference because it keeps the board from just going downwind. If you only yes. have the fins on the tail, the board is going to turn downwind and it's going to be very hard to stay. Uh, you know, crosswind. I've seen people show up at the beach with the SUP board and have that problem where they just go straight downwind. Right. So, so yeah, that's that basically, I guess, tip number one, before you um, try to foil, learn the wing handling with a regular um, board that doesn't have a foil on it, basically, right? Yes. And if you don't have access to that, you can, you know, learn on a foil board, but really get your hands on the biggest foil board you can get. Yeah. And I, I don't know if this is another tip you, you had to, but um, also uh, practice as much as you can on the beach before you get on the water, right? The wing handling, a lot of it, you can practice on the beach before, before you're in the water. Yes, I do have that. Uh, I think okay. it's tip number four or five. Okay. Okay. So tip number two, you want to learn how to steer the board and turn around very close to the beach, specifically learn to turn around before you get out there. Uh, so this is my daughter. She's, she, she has an interesting technique. She'll kneel down at the end of her run, do the turn on her knees so she doesn't fall in, and then stand back up. But the, the point is, is that you're turning around close to the beach. And when I say close, I mean 20 feet out. Get on the board and turn the board around 180 degrees to come back in. Uh, you don't want to get 100 yards offshore and realize you can't turn around. Now, I can keep going or I, I can keep going or we can discuss that idea. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good tip, um, I guess. A lot, I know I've heard of people like they were so excited about getting up on foil and being able to go that they just kept going as long as they could before they fell in. But then when they got way outside, like in Hawaii Kai, for example, um, you realize, oh, I don't know how to go the other way, you know? So, and yeah, so. and Hawaii Kai is Hawaii Kai is slightly offshore, if I remember. Yeah, it's almost offshore. Straight offshore. So maybe that's a tip in itself. You know, you want to. Uh, go in a place where it's side shore. If it's offshore wind, make sure you're sailing with a partner to keep an eye on you. Yeah. And then also it's a good idea to just, um, if you have a place where you can just go downwind and maybe park a car at the other end and don't have to worry about staying upwind in the beginning. Yes. Well, this next clip is all about staying upwind. Okay. And this is something that when I'm teaching my students, I try to focus on getting them to go upwind for a number of reasons. And the biggest reason is that you're not downwind. You don't have to walk back up or find transportation. You spend your time sailing back and forth instead of walking back up. So this next clip here is a little bit longer. It's actually a section 
of a video that I call Maximum Performance. This is the, the tip for beginners on turning the board up wind. And this is one of my edited videos. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and play the whole thing. It's about two or three minutes, and then we can stop and talk about it. Okay, great. One of the things I want to cover real quickly, this is more of at the novice level, and this is for almost the first time wingers. It's really easy to go downwind and end up downwind very quickly. What I want you to try and do is turn the board into the wind. This does two things. One is it gets you going upwind so you're not losing as much ground, and it slows the board. The, the strut is like a windsock or a weather vane. It wants to point the wing into the wind. You can use this constant to leverage the board upwind or downwind by pointing the clue towards the back or front of the board, respectively. So we call the back of the strut the clue or back end of the wing. And if I point that wing I point it downwind, it's going to point the board downwind. So I want to point the strut behind me, or in this case, to my left. And the more I aim it to the left, I'm pulling here, the more it turns into the wind. If I push it away, it turns downwind. This is done while luffing the wing overhead and steering the board through your core. If you come from a windsurfing background, you'll recognize this is similar to windsurfing in that if you drag the clue towards the tail of the board, the board will turn upwind. When you twist the wing towards the tail of the board, the wing wants to return to pointing into the wind, and as it does, it torques your body and board upwind. However, if you sheet in while pulling the clue back, the sheeting will overpower the steering, effectively canceling the wing's torque to turn the board upwind. I'll say it again, oversheeting cancels the upwind effort. Move your hands forward or sheet out as you twist the clue towards the back of the board. So if you're going downwind, fast and sheet it in, it's going to fight you. You need to sheet it out, turn it up wind, and then start. Simply stated, luff the wing as you twist the wing to torque the board up wind. I actually really like how you explained with the weather vane and that, you know, if you pull it kind of the, that the strut wants to point straight down, downwind, and then if you manipulate that, that'll give you a steering momentum. So I've never, yeah. never really heard it explained that way, but it, it like intuitively, intuitively we know how it works, but it's hard to explain it to someone who doesn't understand that concept. So that, I think that's a really good way to explain it. Thank you. I, I've been trying all different ideas. You know, one way to think of the strut as a rudder or a guide, and you're aiming that guide to torque the board on a bunch of different ways to, to show it. And I even now I look at this and I'm like, oh, you know, I might have might do that a little bit differently next time or, or try to explain it differently, which is I try to attack the idea from, from a different angle and, and try different ways. And uh, teaching this to my students early on. I, I couldn't understand why they were going downwind and what was causing it to go downwind. And even myself, I couldn't understand what was the technique to get it to turn up wind uh, until I started, well, trying to solve the problems at night, going to bed at night, thinking, why were they having trouble? Why can't they do that? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I've been trying to trying to capture it on video. Nice. Yep. Okay. I think we're ready for the next tip. And, okay, the next tip is 
more or less where you're standing on the board. So foot placement on the board. Let's start with being off foil. So when you're slogging out to the wind line, your, your front foot should be slightly on the windward side and your back foot on the more or less on the stringer, as opposed to being this orientation. This is going to actually set you up to point further downwind, or that is, it's, it's harder to go upwind in this position than this position. Now the next thing to determine is where to stand on the board regarding the board's flotation. So you may be comfortable standing in the front, but if the nose of the board is purling, you need to move back. On the other hand, if the tail is sinking, you need to move forward. Again, this is off foil. And once you find that flotation point, you want to adjust your foil so that you stay in this position as it comes up on foil. You can't be stepping forward as it transitions to on foil. So you want to have your feet in the spot when it foils. Okay, so uh, one thing that I've done in the past with uh, some of my boards is I've marked on the board uh, some lines just as a reference point. So I kind of have an idea where to stand before it foils. I mean, ideally you want to be comfortably on the flotation. Uh, but when it foils, you want to make sure that your foil is matched with that uh, flotation point. And having marks on the board just give you a better idea where to place your feet. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and if the board is designed well and, you, and your foil is in the right place, basically where you stand to float in the center of flotation, it should also be more or less the where you want to stand once the board lifts up, right? Yes, yes. But you know, you can put the foil too far forward in the track or too far back, or if you have a, a foil with a lot of lift in it, um, you may have to adjust that. But um, yeah, so. And, and, yeah, and then another good point you had in, another, in a different video with the, um, was being centered um, over the center line of the board too, like, cause you might be able to, um, uh, fly on when the board's on the water if you're not exactly in the center it's fine but once the board lifts up and you're on foil you have to be centered exactly over the foil like um, yes. over the center line of the board and that's that's the next clip here staying centered okay i, I do have on um, i mean in this in this shot here you think more of front and back where you're right. you're pressing the nose down and you're you're kicking it up but there's also the side to side. So that's this next clip here. Okay, let's get and into that. We'll just play that whole thing. Okay. Some people are afraid to learn to foil for fear of falling on the foil, a legitimate concern. So let's look at what causes this type of fall. So let's look at the foil. It generates lift. The front wing is lifting up, the back wing, the stabilizer is pushing down, but together, there's force up through the mast, lifting the board. Now it's important that you trim your weight fore and aft. If it's too far in the front, you're gonna stick to the water. If it's too far in the back, you're gonna overfoil. So you're constantly trimming the weight fore and aft. But it's also equally important to keep your center of mass directly over the foil. So the foil is lifting up Gravity is pushing you down. And if they're equal, you stay centered over the board. But often, as a sailor, you have another force that the sail is pulling you laterally. So you need to compensate by leaning back against that pull. And when the board is flat on the water, you have the stability of the ocean. So you can put lateral push on the side of the board. But as soon as it comes up on foil, you don't have that stability. And any sideways push is going to cause it to, in this case, flip away and you fall towards the foil on your bum. And here's a couple examples. Unlike windsurfing, where you're pointing your toes to keep the board flat, in foiling, you're flexing your foot 
to keep your ankles at a right angle to the board, or that is, your body mass is always over the top of the board, and the top means at a right angle too. I have this uh, drone footage, which really shows it, you know, centered right over the top of the board, even though he's hiked out, he's on. And then here, if you draw a line from the mast up through his center of mast, center of mass, you can really see it here. So if, if you're not centered, and I got one more clip here of not being centered, you can see it right there. It's the beginning and the end. Yeah, that's a really good point. And and I I always like to tell people to when they before they try to uh, wing and foil together, maybe just try to learn how to control the foil first. Like um, uh, I guess even going behind a boat though is sometimes. Um, you got the pull from the rope, so you can kind of lean against the rope. Um, so you can be a little bit off centered on, on, on the foil, like, you know, kind of away from the pull of the rope if you're, if you're going sideways. But, um, but just have that feel where you can, where you're foiling on the board without getting pulled or without pressure. So you understand that you have to be right over the center line of the foil and you can't be like offset, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to isolate just the foil skills. I mean, the, the e-foil is, is one way, but the, the e-foil is, is different. The board is pretty heavy, so it's not as responsive as a regular foil board. Um, certainly the, the prone surfers that come to wing foiling, they have this skill already. Uh, going behind a boat um, is good, but I have seen people that have learned behind a boat and when they're out on the wing board, they're leaning back against the wing, trying to wheelie the board. And I'm like, no, no, you can't, you can't leverage, you can't leverage the board like that uh, with the wing the way you can with the rope. Uh, but any foil time that you can get before you get on a wing is good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So the next clip here is about. Uh, wing handling, and that is, uh, we talked about it earlier about practicing on the beach. And here's just a few things, um, a few things you can practice on the beach. Simple stuff like flipping the wing over. And this is a six meter wing, and trying to flip a six meter wing over in the water is pretty tough. So you can practice it on the beach. You can practice standing up. You know, having the wing help you get to your feet. And, you know, the, the wingspan on a six meter, you, you have to go up to the wingtip to flip it over. So it looks easy and it's relatively easy on the beach. It's harder in the water, but that's something you can practice. And just, just practicing like for tacking or jiving, just practicing the hand movements of flipping the wing over on just leaning back against the wing and the wind. And this is something you have to do where there's a breeze. You, you can't do it in your backyard where the wind's all swirly. You really need to have steady wind to get steady feedback. But this is worth doing, taking the time. And there, there's, in most of my instructional videos, I've got some kind of beach homework where you uh, practice on the beach, whether it's the Heineken jibe or uh, tacking or whatever. Yeah, no, that's really good advice, I think. And a lot of times the beginners too don't, if you don't have a wing, uh, like a kiting or windsurfing or sailing background, um, just beginners have a hard time understanding exactly where the wind is coming from and how to angle your wing in relation to the wind and, you know, which way you want to go in and out, you know, what, what direction can you go and what directions you can't, you know, you can't go straight into the wind, obviously. And, Things like that, you know, that's things people don't understand at first, I think, or don't don't think about really. So just learning that, and then also 
I like to get people to just ha keep the wingtip kind of uh, get the wingtip low to the sand, but without touching it, you know, like controlling the height of the wing. Yes. On the beach, you know. And that that's something that that I mean, I've got videos on that and all the clips here. This is just a fraction of the stuff that I have. Mm -hmm. And there's there's so much more on. Um, there's so many more tips and these these I wouldn't call these the top five tips. These are just five tips in general. Um, and I also, you know, the sport's still relatively young and we may look back in a few years and think, oh, we were teaching that progression where it's so much better to teach this progression. You know, there's still, there's still so much we're learning about the sport. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's definitely the, the idea of sheeting and steering the wing. Um, I've taken a couple stabs at, at explaining that. And in one video, I have one video up there already on, but I'm gonna, I have another video where I'm trying to explain it uh, more clearly to sailors or non-sailors. And just the idea of sheeting in and out to catch the wind and spill it, that's relatively easy. But when you throw in the, the steering of the wing up and down in front of you, like you said, having the wing tip right on the sand and taking it above your head and separating those two skills it's it's a challenge to get people to understand that. I mean, it's it's really simple once you get it, but it's it's uh, sometimes difficult to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you have to grasp that concept first, and yeah, and I like to like even the more advanced um, maneuvers and like you know all the different tacks and things like that on your Patreon channel. You have like really detailed infra, uh, videos. Uh, breaking it down step by step into really easy to follow steps that uh, very detailed and you know so um, I highly recommend that your instructional videos are great you know uh, thank um, you and and I think you know those beginner tips are great not just for the beginners but also for more advanced guys because you're gonna have to show other help other people that are learning and just understanding how to explain things like how to steer the board up into the wind. I mean, th those are kind of things, if you have a good way to explain it and to make it easy to understand that that'll help a lot, you know? Yes. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, the, my following on Patreon has grown uh, almost to 700 at the moment or just over 700 at the moment. And the, the range of skills on you know, there's beginners on there that are just trying to get up for the first time. And then there's uh, advanced sailors that are asking for jumping and uh, more advanced stuff. Uh, this recent video, the one you're looking at gliding on foil, that's more for entry level. Uh, it's gliding is a skill that, uh, you know, you take for granted. It's really easy to do once you know how to do it. But um, I had a number of students recently that I could see they were relying on the wing for support and they, they didn't have the feel for gliding. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, okay. So yeah, I just wanted to, um, I'm just screen sharing this now, your, your Patreon channel and yeah, it's 747 patrons. That's, that's great. And congratulations on that. So no, thank you. It's actually, um, I mean, I guess if you get a, enough people supporting you, then it's actually, you can actually make a living being a virtual instructor, basically, right? Just making the instructional videos and, and teaching it. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, so that, that seems like a really good um, business model for you, yeah? Well, I kind of fell into it, you know, with COVID when they, when they shut down all the restaurants and airplanes and they closed the beach parks. Uh, that's when I started doing this and someone suggested I do a, a premium online video here on Patreon. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that for the last almost two years now. I think there's 20, 22 or 24 videos, instructional videos ranging from the first time holding the wing to more advanced stuff like 360s and uh, Heineken jibes and that kind of stuff, you know, Heineken jibes and the 360s, that's probably the, the top 10% of wingers out there. I think the majority of, of wingers are working on basic stuff like this jibe here. Uh, that's George, one of our local sailors. 
Uh, this is Kane DeWild demonstrating how to glide on a swell. Uh, so this is this is a clip from the wave video. Uh, so there's there's all different skill levels here, and I've tried to tried to address all of them. Yeah, I, I like kind of how you explain how to like, I guess that's a challenging thing at first for people that are used to just always having the wing powered up and kind of leaning against the wing that to transition into not using the wing and just gliding on the foil without using the wing wind power. Right. So, um, yeah. so that's what you're kind of explaining and, and just doing it kind of real step by step. Um, slowly um, kind of getting used to this um, using the, the f energy from the foil without having the wing pull you along. Yes. And if you come from a, a prone foiling background, you already know how to do this automatic. Uh, right. But for the prone foilers, I've got tips on how to use the wing. <laughs> so, yeah, that makes sense. And I think this is a really important skill for, for jibing because um, basically when you're going into the jibe, you have to depower the wing and, and just surf, surf a turn on, or, you know, do a turn on the foil without using the wind power, basically, right? Yes, that was the idea of it. Right. So that angle right there, that that's I got this new camera mount. Uh -huh. Well, actually, it's not new, but I had to modify it for that board. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about the um, the different handles. So you know, on the on the duotone wings, you have the the rigid handles, um, and then some. You have some that have like the the longer boom handle, like this one, and then the the new um, D Lab unit that you're using has two two separate handles. Um, yes, yeah, so this talk, we're looking at a little at... bit about the handles and and um, yeah the the advantages and disadvantages of having rigid handles and uh, two handles versus one long handle and so on. Uh, well, coming from a windsurf background, I've always liked the boom, and in fact, the the first wings that my neighbor Ken was making all had booms. So we started with boom. I don't know if you remember the the first echoes. Um, they had they had a boom, and the nice thing about the boom is it's infinite hand placement. You can put your hands anywhere along the boom when you're flipping the wing over your head. It's really easy to to feel where the boom is. You don't have to look where the handles are. You shouldn't be looking even if you have handles. And the, the boom is so much more rigid than the, the webbing handles. So in fact, most manufacturers now are, are switching to some kind of rigid handle. Um, the handles, I've gotten used to the handles, but initially when I went from the boom to the handles, I was grabbing in between the handles and, and missing and falling in. Uh, now I can grab the boom or grab the handles pretty much every time without looking. I kind of know where they are. Uh, some of the, the bigger wings, the handles are a little further apart. So I've got to remember to reach further back. Um, so, but that's one of the things. You, you, ever, you ever miss when you have the boom or the two handles? I, I notice like when I come out of a jive, I like to grab the wing right in the middle with one hand so that it kind of flies um, but it would be kind of right between those two handles. So do you ever miss having that, that, that grip in the, right in the middle or you just get used to it? Um, I did get used to it. I did have that problem. I'd grab right in the middle and fall. Mm. Um, so it, it took me a while to retrain my hands. Uh, I still prefer the boom over the handles, but these, this D-Lab wing, is really superior. This cloth, it's super stiff. So the wing is really tight and light. You can see there, it's just, it's really nice. So I'll tolerate the handles to use that wing. Um, and- so, so let's talk about that a little bit. So the, that new, um, this is the Lula fabric on the new um, Duotone D-Lab wing. And then they also have the unit in with the regular Dacron uh, leading edge and, um, and strut. So yes. can you talk a little bit about the difference between the two? And I know that there's a big difference in price. So I, I just wondering what, what you think they have the difference between the difference between the two and if it's worth it for the average user to spend more to get that. Well, the wings are, are virtually the same shape. 
uh, slash design, just different cloth. So the, the yellow cloth, the Alula cloth, makes it really stiff and light. So if you're into performance, the Alula is the way to go. Uh, the, I think the sizes are from two up to seven meter, or no, two and a half to seven meter, but the Alula, the D labs don't start until three five. Um, but you're really gonna appreciate the Alula cloth uh, in the bigger sizes on, um, you know, five, six, seven meter. That's in the light wind where you want that lightness and stiffness. Now, as far as the value on, um, you know, money is different things to do. It's a different thing for everybody. For right. some people, money's not an issue. They can get whatever they want. Um, you know, I think as a novice, Patty, my wife, her favorite wing is the SLS 3.5 unit. Um, I really like the 5.0 D-Lab. I think that's what we're looking at here. Um, yeah, this is, I think this is the 3.5 or the 3 meter SLS. This is one of her favorite wings. Although she recently tried the D-Lab 4. And she said, this is my new favorite wing. And, and this is my wing. <laughs> she, she tried to claim my 4.0. Uh, well, I'll <laughs> share it with you. Uh, yeah. that, that's interesting. Um, yeah, that you're saying that, um, that yeah, it makes more of a difference in, in a bigger wing on, in lighter wind, obviously. Yeah, because if you have plenty of wind, then I guess actually sometimes having a little bit of weight in the wing can actually be a good thing too in some cases, right? I mean, it's not always not always the case that lighter is always better, but definitely in a big wing and light wind, it makes a, it can make a big difference, right? Yes, yes. Well, I, I'm not sure where heavy is good, but- uh, In a wing, yeah, that's true. But I think you, you're gonna, they're, they're all good, but you're gonna appreciate the bigger sizes uh, with the D lab and, and really as a novice sailor, you'll be fine with the SLS. I think it, you're going to pay a little extra for that performance in the Alula cloth. Okay, cool. So, um, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the recent event you mentioned earlier, the Patagonia Kite and Wing Fest. Um, you said that was just recently and there was a freestyle um part of it and a race part of it right so let's yes. talk a little bit about that that event i did uh film a little bit of the freestyle mm -hmm. on and i can try and share that here uh, i was the patagonia maui kite and wing foil festival mm -hmm. was at kanaha beach park and when i got my camera out the battery was flashing uh almost dead so I just filmed one heat. Uh, this is Chris McDonald. He won the event with moves like this. Oh, wow. Uh, he's 16 years old from the gorge. Uh, this, uh, here's Kai Lenny. He dropped in and he was doing moves. I'm, I'm not sure how he finished up. I think he made it to the final. I only filmed one heat. Just this is Andre, he's a local ripper. He did pretty well. And I think also in this heat, uh, Otis Buckingham. Now that's Chris again. Uh, that's so smooth can, as for You can see growing. why he won the event there. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So there was racing. And unfortunately, I don't have any video of the race stuff. Uh, but you I, you told me earlier that you actually won won the race event, right? So just tell us about it. I I did. I I spent a lot of time training for it, and I I had some really good gear. And one of the guys I sail with all the time, he says, you know, when you're out there, I can I can see you're sailing with purpose. You know, you're you're training uh, for this, and I did. I did. I worked really hard on it and I, I actually I'm going to just show a little clip of the board that I used on um, so I, I got this new board flying dutchman this is with that camera mount I'll show you that camera mount in a minute mm -hmm. and then I posted this on Instagram this little clip coming up here 
So this Flying Dutchman is different from my previous board in that it's a little narrower. Mark made it a little narrower so I wouldn't drag the rail while I was going to windward. What are the dimensions? Sorry? Oh, what are the dimensions of the board? Uh, it's four foot 11 by 21 inches wide and it's about 60 liters. 22 wide, 60 liters. No, no, okay. 20, 21 wide. Oh, 21, 21, wide. 21. Um, okay. Pretty narrow, four, yeah. Four foot 11. Lines in the board so that when I do touch down, there's more of a planing surface. The rail's not digging in. And on the back, there's no tail rocker, no tail kick, just a sharp edge. And this really helps to release the board from the water. Now it's also matched with a Mike's Lab. And I wasn't sure about the Tuttle Box, but after trying it in this board, it's super solid. It's like, it's like all one piece. No moving parts, there's no play whatsoever. It's just really tight. And then, then my result in the, in the racing, uh, I finished, I actually won the racing event. Excellent. Yeah, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. And you're probably not the youngest one in there, yeah? <laughs> uh, by far, by far. In fact, you could probably fit a whole generation in between uh, me and the, the next place. Yeah. I, uh, when I went to the registration up in Paia, it was at uh, uh, mandatory. I, I went up there and I got in line and everyone in front of me was a teenager. And I thought, oh man, what am I doing here? I mean, the, the older guys were in their 20s. Uh, oh, yeah. So, so like one third your age, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I have to say that the Maui fleet and, and Oahu, there were a couple people that came over from Oahu, both the, the men and women, young men and women. They're going to be a force. They've got some talent. And, you know, they, they were going plenty fast in the racing, but the start line and the tactics uh that's where my experience came in so um, so tell us how that whole uh, how it worked if, what was the format like how did the start work where, where how, how were the turns and upwind downwind and so on just like, tell us how that format worked uh well they had they had a rabbit start that is that a jet ski raced across the start line and you'd pass behind the jet ski on um, and we'd race out it was a close reach to a mark outside. And then from that mark, we had to go upwind to a windward mark. So it, the way it was set up, it sort of spread everyone out on. And I had some good starts. And then the upwind leg, it was favored on the inside. It was a little bit north wind. So you'd get a good lift along the shoreline, which I knew from experience where most of the fleet went outside into deeper water where the wind was lighter and there was more current. Um, there were uh, some of the kids that Chris McDonald, he was very fast. He beat me to the windward mark uh, twice, uh, but I was able to catch him on the downwind run. It was almost a straight downwind run to the finish line. So you had to kind of zigzag your way to get down there. And uh, Kai, I think he was able to pump downwind faster than with the than the wind. You know, his his pumping skills, um, where most of the other sailors had to zigzag back and forth. And I was using a six meter, it was light wind by Maui standards. Uh, and I was using a six meter. Uh, so yeah, I feel pretty good about that win. I, I think it's uh probably my last competition, you know, I'm, I'm passing the baton onto these younger people that are, that are, I'm anxious to see where they take the sport. And I'm confident in the Maui no Riders. We have you're so the, much wind over You're the there. defending champion. You can't no. give up after the first time. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I've, I've, yeah. Yeah. I'm 60 years old, Robert. Yeah. So, that, you know, it's that, tough to compete with young. 16 and <laughs> I remember when I was doing windsurfing competition, when I was 20, I was looking to the guys that were 25 and I thought, well, those guys have peaked. They've peaked at 25. 
and for sure in in windsurfing jumping freestyle doing the loops and having the the flexibility you know i think you do peak in your early 20s you know more endurance style type of stuff on um, more in your 30s in your 60s i'm not sure i think what i've earned is that shirt that says old guys rule i think that's about it on um, and well, I really the experience too, right? You have, you got the experience and, and then you, like you said, you train with the purpose and you, you're ready for it. So yeah. uh, you're not just winging it, you know, you're actually winging it. Yeah. We... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's awesome. I, I love that you can, you can still um, beat everyone, including the guys I... like Kai Lenny, you know, that's pretty awesome. Oh, uh, you know, no, Kai is Kai. He, uh, it was funny during the during the wave event. One of the announcers uh, talked about Kai being a legend, and I thought, if, well, I mean, he's he is a legend as far as his ability. There's no question there. But when I think of legend as in old, if he's a legend, what does that make me? Am I? A, I guess I'm a fossil, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, but no, uh, Kai and all the younger kids. You know, Kai's he's so good at everything. And he hasn't really put effort into wing racing. And I think if he spends just, you know, a very short period of time, he'll be on the top of his game. I mean, it seems like whatever he tries at, he succeeds. Uh, but there's there's a lot of other young talent on Maui that that is really good. And I we have the Maui advantage in that we have wind almost every day you can wing. Um, and with the waves, uh, Kane DeWild is doing some turns in the waves that are really impressive. And he's he's just getting started. So it's going to be really exciting to watch as this younger generation leads the way. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm stepping aside. <laughs> so and then I guess uh, something I was going to ask you too, like you use you generally two foot straps in the front and, and then no, no foot strap in the back which means basically you're not, you're not really jump. You can't really use that setup to jump or not jump very high anyways. Yeah, right. Or do, uh, you correct. Just, do you most, do you just avoid jumping usually or, or do you actually do jumps with, with that? Setup? I, I do not do jumps. And early on, I made a pledge to myself that I would not take the sport to the air on. Um, I had a back injury surfing. Uh, a compressed vertebrae, a wedge vertebrae. Mm -hmm. And my physical therapist says I can't afford another, another fall. So I don't trust myself. You know, I, I'm looking at, at these guys doing jumps. You know, I've studied Chris McDonald's, you know, flips. And I'm like, I could do that. I know I could do that. But no, I know better. So I'm the the back there's no back foot strap because i do move my foot around a lot and uh, it does keep me from jumping i was just noticing in this picture the leash i have it attached to the foot strap because uh -huh. when i have it attached to the back of the board it would flip and get in the way uh of the camera oh so, okay so i want to show you, you my need, camera. You need one of those retracting leashes that like i, I should send you one of those but um, I, I, yeah, I, I noticed like actually keep, why don't you keep that up for a little bit? I wanted to talk about the equipment a little bit. Yeah, I noticed you have the leash plug mounted on the tail of the board, I guess. Is that so it's kind of more out of the way of your feet or less drag or what's what's the idea behind that? On um, mounting it back there. Uh, sorry, here. Uh, oh. Mark uh, Rappahorse at Flying Dutchman suggested mm -hmm. I put it back there. And it seems like a good spot. I noticed I do have a prone foil board that I use for surfing. Mm -hmm. And the, the mount is, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but yeah. the mount is right there. And I found as a regular foot surfer, as I stand up, my foot would always drag over the leash and I'd end up standing on the leash cord. Mm. Yeah. Now I'm not planning on doing any prone foiling with this board, yeah. but it, it made sense on there was one other rider that had the same setup mm -hmm. and he felt that the leash was dragging in the water on um, so yeah. 
I mean, I think for, for racing, especially to have a leash dragging in the water, it just totally doesn't make sense. Yeah. So anyway, but, um, okay. So, so yeah, the two front straps also that way you, the back foot, if, if you just had one center strap, um, you tend to kind of have both feet a little bit off to one rail, right? So being able to offset your back foot more towards the opposite rail helps with keeping your weight centered too, right? And yes. That, that's and, one of the reasons why you don't use a back foot strap too, I'm sure, right? Yes, because I, I would stand on it. And I also found too that sometimes when I would do a tack, as I switched my feet, I found myself stepping on the far side of the board to keep it from rolling over, from scissoring. Right. So odd. And the other reason is I did, I was using a back strap for a while and I fell and kind of tweaked my ankle, didn't injure myself, but tweaked it enough that I thought I'm taking that strap off. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it also helps sometimes moving your back foot forward or backward, depending on how fast you're going or trying to get up in light wind and things like that, right? Yes. You can now, shift your weight a little bit. On this board, oh, I don't have the foot straps. It doesn't show the foot straps here. Oh, but the foot straps I have, they're longer foot straps. They're not the standard uh, eight inch. They're about 12 or 14 inches. Mm. And I place the inserts further apart so that I could slide my foot forward in uh, when I was going real fast to compensate for the additional lift by the foil. Uh, and then move it back when I was going to windward or so I really like the ability to be able to move my foot fore and aft still in the strap mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I've taken some other videos I've got a lot of different uh, camera mounts and in fact let me let me pull up one of those camera mounts here on um, okay but before yeah actually I did want to ask you about the foil as well. So and I, know, I noticed you had a few um, shots of the foil there too, but yeah. So don't, don't turn off the grease screen sharing yet. <laughs> okay. But yeah. Um, Go ahead. This particular clip here. It uh, doesn't really, well, you know, a lot of times I'll do different camera angles and trying to capture one thing and I realize, oh, this is a really good example of where the foot is, or I didn't realize the wing was this way, or when I put the camera on the front of the board, it really shows my front foot, my toes curling up and down. Uh, not so much in this video, but on, um, didn't realize how much I was using the front strap to manipulate the board. Or leverage, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, I mean, I find that, that yeah, if having foot straps just allows you to turn much harder too. Like you just feel more connected to the board. So you, you're able to like crank harder turns if you have that, those foot straps, right? Yes. But, and I, I did do uh, some video recently and the board didn't have foot straps. And it was a performance oriented board, but I just didn't put the foot straps on there. And I found that I couldn't do the tacks and the jibes as aggressively without the foot strap. So I do definitely pull with my front foot to pull the board around or leverage it this way or so. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's talk about the foil because I think maybe the foil might be one of the most important parts of the equipment. And, you know, like the, those Mike, Mike's Labs foil, I know that like Johnny Heineken in San Francisco, he's been winning a lot of the races there with, with those foils too, right? And it just seems like he's going faster than everyone else. And I, uh, so, but anyway, talk a little yeah, bit about Mike, Mike has been making the carbon foils for the kite racers. Uh, for quite a while, he's been making foils. And more recently for, I mean, he's, he's got a reputation of making the fastest foils, particularly in the kite racing fleet. Now I think he's winging himself and he's made foils for winging, specifically for winging. And this is one of them. It's the bullet series. I believe he makes an 1100 an 800 and a 600. And this is the 600. Uh, and let me see if I can get a little bit better angle of it on. 
So it's actually yeah. the smallest, the smallest foil in his in the series, yeah. Uh, yes, he does have a smaller foil for kite racing, right? Uh, but it has a shorter fuselage, and he's also got a tiny little race foil on. I think it's the four ten tow foil, and apparently, I think one of the kite racers clocked forty six knots on it. Wow. Yeah, I don't want. I don't want to go that fast. So, so this the six hundred size is that square centimeters, like projected surface area or something like that, or do, yeah, yes, okay, yes, square centimeters. This is, this is a full on top performance race foil. It's not something that you know the average person uh, is going to use. It's very sharp uh, edges on it. It's pointy and. Uh, it's delicate, you know, it, you bump the bottom and it, it, uh, it you don't want to, you don't want to scratch it, not just because it's expensive, but because the performance of it mm. on, you know, I use the, the go foils and they are tough. They're tough on, um, I'd scrape the bottom all the time coming in, you know, hitting a rock right in the sand. Um, so I just, I just wanted to describe it a little bit for those listening to the podcast. So it's, it looks like it has a really thin front wing, uh, pretty flat with like a little curve, uh, the tip slightly curved down or straightened out basically with the little dihedral maybe. And yes. like everything's full carbon, looks, looks like sanded finish. And then it looks like it has a really long mass too. What is that like a uh, hundred centimeters, something like that? Or how, this, how long is that mass? This one is a 96. Okay. Uh, they make a 102 and I believe a, an 80 something. Um, uh -huh. I tried the 102 and I could see the advantage of using it on a coast run where you're blistering downwind in, in tall chop. You want to be able to clear the wave tops, but still keep your foil underwater. Uh, and going to windward, I could, I could really lean over, but going just a little bit longer, there was a little tiny bit of wobble in it compared to the the 96 and uh and it it with the tuttle box it just is really tight so i think this is the right length mass for me on uh, it is it is a little bit long for low tide at kanaha well low tide is off limits uh medium medium tide is okay you kind of know you learn where the spots are where you can go and where you can't uh, but the, the medium size is perfect for me. And the, the leading edge, fuselage, and trailing edge is all one piece, which I think is one reason why it's so stiff and so tight. Mm -hmm. So the only place it comes apart is like right, right at the, um, the joint between the mass and the fuselage. And then this, yes. is all one, this is all one piece construction? All one piece construction. So there's two parts. There's the mast the and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And the you can adjust the pitch in the stabilizer. He has a system pretty clever. You, you put a spacer, I used a little nylon washer and you put that spacer in there. And then as you screw the three bolts down tight to the mast, it, it flexes the fuselage just ever so little bit. And that changes the pitch in the back, back wing. The oh, interesting. So, uh, a bigger spacer flexes it more and gives it less pitch where mm. no stabilizer is more pitch. Interesting. I mean, no, so, no spacer. So to get a setup like that, like how, how did, you, did you have to like special order it? How, how long does it take and about how much does it, does it cost if somebody wanted to order one? On it, when I originally placed my order on, um, it was a 12 week wait. And they took my order with no deposit. They said when it was ready, they would, they would send for the check. And I told them uh, that I was planning on racing in this event. And if I could get it, you know, a week beforehand, um, that'd be great. And well, they expedited it. They got it out to me early enough that I could, that I could train on it. And, uh, but I believe it's a 12 week waiting list, but I also know that they, uh, can you can wait longer on um, it was 
about $3,500 for the whole setup. Mm -hmm. uh, that, well, that is the, the foil. I believe that included shipping. Um, and at this point, I'm, I'm putting it away until I do more testing with Ken and racing with Ken. Trying to keep up with Ken Winter is pretty tough. He also has a, a Mike Slab 800. And that's really why I got this 600 was so that I could keep up with him trying to test <laughs> the wings. And of course, it's a great race wing. But when I'm free riding and teaching, I'm, I'm using the, the go foils. So I, uh, you guys obviously don't want to scrape over the reef with it on low tide or whatever, right? So no. like you said, it's fragile and, and it, you don't want to scratch it and, and ruin the performance. So makes sense. But would you say that was one of the, your secret uh, ingredients to, to winning the, the race part of it? Yes, for sure. Uh, the, the foil, but also the board. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had some great wings too, the D-Labs. And... So actually, like something I wanted to mention too, like for the board, like because because it's such a thin profile, and uh, I'm assuming that it takes a it has a pretty high takeoff speed. Like you can't like some of the big thick foils, you can pop up at pretty low speeds, but this one looks like it would take a little bit higher speeds to to pop up on foil, right? You know, surprisingly, it it pops right up. Now oh, yeah? some of it's some of it's my experience. But it uh, it was lighter wind uh, during the regatta, and uh, there are a couple times when I during the weekend that I had to pump pretty hard, flapping the wing and pumping the board to get up. But the majority of the time, uh, it's basically sheet in and go. Hmm, it's okay. a combination of the foil. There's so little drag; it it reaches takeoff speed very quickly, and. And that's the total and, box. And what the about tunnel? the what about the stall speed? Like, is it, does it like do you do you, do you ever have a problem like stalling with it, stalling the foil, or not really? Uh, not really. That last video that I posted on gliding on foil, pretty mm -hmm. much everything you see, I'm riding this foil. Mm, okay. And it it has a, a very nice glide to it. Mm, okay. Surprisingly, I'm, and I was thinking that on the windiest days that I might be able to do a SUP foil run with this setup, that there's almost enough volume. I mean, there is enough volume to float me to standstill. Whether or not I could paddle it fast enough with a paddle to get up on foil. Um, and I've been out outside the reef in the rollers, luffing the wing and gliding for quite a ways a uh, couple hundred yards and thinking I could do this with a paddle. But once it does slow down, it's pretty tough to get the speed back up again, pumping it with your legs. But I'm pretty certain that 800 would work on a coast run. Uh, nice. So yeah, the, the downwind paddling is something else I wanted to ask you about too, but let, let's finish the, the equipment thing here. So, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the wings, the important, uh, importance of the wings. We, we talked a little bit about the board, the, the foot straps, the foil. So, I mean, obviously the wing is the other thing that's really important, having the right size wing and then the, and, uh, the right profile and, and uh, shape and all that kind of stuff for upwind, downwind and so on. So talk a little bit about that, like what you found is works best for you on um, well the 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 d labs are pretty tough to beat um, you know you probably know or maybe for the people that don't know uh ken winner lives across the street the designer for duotone he's one of the designers he, there's a team in europe that that works with him as well but he's the main guy and i'll go out and race with him on um, and every now and then I'll throw out my ideas about you know what to do, and he he quickly shoots them down. So he's really he does everything. On um, I'm just a benchmark out there racing with him, but he wants to race upwind, and then turn around and race downwind, and then we swap wings and do it again. And there's another another guy that runs with us regularly, uh, Peter Slate. He is uh, he's national slalom champion in windsurfing. So he's got some experience in racing and he's the, the three of us go out there and beat up on each other. Um, but Ken really, 
uh, puts a lot of emphasis on the speed of the wing upwind. Um, and really, when you think about it, if you have a wing that goes fast and is stable, both upwind and downwind, it's going to work uh, on, in every aspect. Um, you know, being able to get the speed to jump, being able to get on foil quickly. Um, so he's he's got all these different parameters, and it's amazing to me. We'll we'll go out and do a number of runs, and he'll decide right away. Oh, this one needs more, it needs more of this or that. Um, so what what determines the upwind speed of a wing? I guess the drag, the depth, the pro, as a flatter profile, or I mean, or more tension, or like what are the things that that make it work better on up going upwind? Uh, well, the, the stiffness of the, the frame, yeah. the, um, the canopy tension, the draft position, um, tw the amount of twist or leech tension, all, all those things, um, you know, that's, that's really his wheelhouse. I don't really uh, yeah. try to design or pretend to be a designer. Um, I think the draft position is really important, like, because if it travels backwards, then it kind of ruins the upwind performance, right? If the draft kind of um, flexes too much or, or moves moves back too much, then that'll kind of ruin the forward propulsion, right? Yes, yes. And you know, when we get, you know, he'll he'll get a new wing and and it looks really good, and we'll go out and test it. And sometimes it's amazing, and there's a clear cut difference that it's better or worse. Other times they're very similar. But he seems to know exactly what changes to make, and uh, we'll try again. Well, yeah, I've been trying to get Ken to come on this show for um, for over a year, and uh, he's always too busy designing new wings and kites. So, but he said maybe check back with him in, in at the end of July. So I'm gonna keep keep trying. I'm gonna keep <laughs> yeah. trying to get him on the show. He seems right. to be kind of a little bit. Uh, he doesn't want to be in the limelight either, I guess, right? So, yes, he's but, he's very interesting. Definitely trying to get him on the show. And then, you know, like just uh, for those who haven't watched the first interview that we did, uh, I just kind of want to do a little recap that you basically grew up in Kailua. Like, I think Pete Cabrino was one of your neighbors. You learned to wing, windsurf at a young age and then uh, moved to Maui, started your lesson business, and then now, you know, now teaching the, the winging. Um, but the, the way you got into wing foiling was um, basically you were doing downwind foil, stand-up foil downwinders with Mark Rappahorse and Ken Winner, right? And then yes. Ken was kind of having a hard time getting up on the foil. So, uh, or, you know, so, so he basically designed this wing to try and you were kind of, you were kind of making fun of him for about it but then you saw at some point you saw it and you said it looked like poetry in motion and you had to try it as well right so yes that that image of him coming down the swells is burned into my my brain uh that was kind of the turning point it's like okay i gotta try this and because up until yeah. that point we were we were sup foiling down the coast and we were waiting for ken to catch up and in this case we were sitting there waiting for him to catch up and he came down the swell it was just a beautiful thing so that was when I made the decision to try it. And at that point, uh, I think Flash Austin had made his own wing out of spars. And he went out and did a run on the SUP board uh, out and back, got some video. And then the wing fell apart. And so the story goes. And he never put it back together. It was kind of a novelty thing. But, and Ken but, saw that. And he said, OK, I'm going to make a wing and, and try it. So, so he, Flash he was, Austin was kind of the pioneer, but then Ken actually developed the first inflatable wing kind of thing, right? Yeah. Is that how it worked? Okay. Yeah. And it wasn't so much that I was making fun of him. It was more of uh, my scratching my head. What is he doing? Uh, right. But yeah, he's, yeah. I think he can be. Uh, now there's one other guy, Tony Lagosh, that, that I believe did an inflatable wing on, uh, and I think there might be some video of him out there on foil, but he was ahead of his time. It didn't catch on. Right. So. right. Okay. So, okay. So, but what, basically what I wanted to ask you is like, I lately I've been listening because I, that's kind of how I got into wing foiling too, is like we are doing downwind uh, stand up foiling and like here on Oahu, the wind is not that good usually. So we're kind of struggling with that, trying to, um, 
you know, like in mediocre conditions, it's so hard to get up on foil and stay up on foil. So when the wings came out, that was just like, oh, this is so much easier, you know, and, and more fun because you're always at the foiling. You, you don't have to struggle to get back up when once you come off the foil. But um, lately I've been listening to the James Casey podcast. He has like a really good podcast now about downwind foiling. He's really enthusiastic about it, trying to get people into downwind foiling. And uh, I talked to Mark Rappahorse in the interview, and he said that's kind of still his biggest passion, even though he doesn't get to do it as much anymore. But I wanted to ask you, do you still do downwind stand-up foiling, or did you kind of give up on that since you started winging? Um, I kind of gave up on it uh, since I started winging. And not. I did a run with Mark Rappahorse, and we did it late in the evening. It was really rough, and he got ahead of me, and I tried really hard to stay with him. And the next morning, I, my back hurt so bad I couldn't walk. Mm. Uh, so I kind of laid off from it. But now there's some new uh, boards that are coming out. Dave Kalama, he uh, calls it the Barracuda. Yeah. And it's quite a bit narrower and longer. And it looks like it's relatively easy to get up on foil. And since I laid off the downwinding, uh, the foils have improved quite a bit. And I think they're easier and faster. So I'm, I'm thinking, yes, I want to try it again. Uh, but at the moment, I'm still wrapped up in winging. So, yeah, no, I'm exactly the same way. I kind of got, I, I kind of stopped doing it once I got into winging, but now I'm kind of getting curious and yeah, hearing about the new equipment that makes it a little bit easier, like compared to what we we're using um, early on. I think uh, might be worth another try on, on a good day though. I wouldn't want to go out in mediocre conditions if, it, if the waves are, or the wind swells ni nice and clean and easy to, to get up on them. I definitely going to try it again, but I kind of, kind of got out of it too. And, but yeah. Okay. So uh, just a few more things. I know uh, it's been, oh gosh, it's almost two hours already, but um, oh. I didn't want to ask you, you know, like, in one of your videos, you mentioned um, rotator cuff um, pain that you had like in your shoulders. And that's why you kind of like to practice the movements before you do it on the water to avoid um, hurting yourself and so on, which I think makes a lot of sense. And I can relate to that too. I had, I had some ro rotator cuff issues, mostly from stand up paddling, like, you know, doing like the Molokai race and training a lot and stuff like that kind of inflamed my, my shoulder. So I had to do, uh, I was actually had um, really bad pain for like two years and I had to do physical therapy and stuff like that and um, I found some good exercise that worked really well so whenever I kind of have a flare-up I do I, I do more of those exercises and that really helps but um but yeah I just kind of wanted to hear your your side of it like what what kind of pain you have and and how you deal with it and, and what you do and so on well fortunately uh my shoulders have healed up and I don't have the shoulder pain that I was having um, I, you know, I was just using Advil and ice um, and that, you know, it, it would tend to bother me at night in my sleep. Um, so icing it and Advil. And then once I was stronger, I did some, you know, simple exercises with dumbbells, you know, these, and, and that seemed to, to help lightweight dumbbells. Um, so fortunately I have not had any, any trouble lately, but Oh, good. Winging is something that that it might restrict people that have shoulder problems. That it might be a, a problem to to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But the the new wings are are so much lighter and stiffer. They don't muscle you around um, like the older ones. Mm -hmm. So maybe that that's an improvement. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's definitely a good idea to practice the movements on on the beach first, to, just to make sure that the, you don't get yanked around by the wind, wind, you know, like no unexpected motion or throwing you back, like pulling the shoulder backwards or whatever, yes. trying to lift up the and, wing. Those are the things that bother my shoulder. And and I found there's a little exercise I do on the beach where I I bring the wing up overhead and then back down, up overhead, and even behind me and back down. And I found that that has really improved my tax. Just doing that little warm up on the beach when I go out in the water, I, I feel more confident mm -hmm. doing the tax. Yeah, and I, I think too, like um, I was watching on your Patreon channel that one uh, about tacking 201, I think you called it, but just 
like when you when you bring your wing over your head just to kind of give the clue a little push so it it kind of ticks over and 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 lands in the right place to accelerate out of the attack that's a super important um thing to to learn how to do before before you try to do those attacks especially on your heel side right yeah 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 but um also you know just regarding um aging well and, and staying healthy and and so on like do you have any any good tips i mean i'm i'm almost 55 now so i'm not that far behind you and um i find you know as i get older like you know you, it's easy you know obviously get injured easier um nutrition is super important like so do you have any kind of uh, tips or or um things you do that that help you uh, avoid inflammation or like nutrition anything like that on um, you know i i try to stay hydrated on um, i do every now and then maybe once or twice a month i'll take advil or motrin you know if i've had a long day on um, but i think just staying active you know i i started water sports when i was 12 years old and i told my wife that i'd been practicing for this sport since i was 12 and really i've my whole life i've been fortunate enough to spend in and around the water uh, surfing windsurfing sailing kite surfing paddling you know i, I did the molokai to oahu a number of times with a teammate, uh, then sup foiling, uh, and now wing foiling. You know, it just, uh, then I probably put in four days a week uh, wing foiling. Um, it's fortunate here on Maui that we have wind virtually every day and you can go just about any time you want. Uh, but just getting out on the water and, and staying active. Uh, and I'm a little older. So I am cautious to avoid things that I might get injured, uh, like jumping. Uh, and I try not to overdo it on my sessions, you know, in an hour or two, I use a harness so I can stay out longer on. Um, and with the harness, I'm not putting the load on my shoulders going to windward on. Um, but yeah, just trying to stay active. You know, I'm, I'm wing foiling has kept me young. It's gotten me back in the water. I was kind of over, I was over windsurfing. I was over kite surfing on uh, the, the prone paddling or the, the sup paddling was hurting my lower back. That, that motion was just grinding my, my spine. And I, I uh, but wing foiling, it's an, other than the initial stages of climbing on the board, falling off, climbing on the board, once you get past that point, there's very little pressure in your hands. And because the foil is above the chop or the board is above the chop, it's like powder snow. So there's, there's not a whole lot of pressure. And there, there's people out there that say, oh, you don't need a harness. There's no pressure. And that's true unless you're racing Ken Winter upwind. You know, you need that power to, to drive upwind. Uh, but it's, it's just really forgiving easy on the body. And I, I hope that, uh, I know I have a number of, uh, patrons and students that are over 70 that are foiling and being 60, they're an inspiration to me that I, I think I can keep doing this for another 10 years, barring any injuries. Uh, I think it's, you know, a, I agree. A really good I thing. mean, yeah. Keeps you young. Uh, yeah. It's like a fountain of youth and it's great to see so many different age groups doing it too. And like you said, the initial learning curve is a little bit, uh, can be a little bit dangerous, you know, like, especially for older people, you have to be real careful not to injure yourself in the beginning, I think. But once you kind of get it down, it's really, um, yeah, like you said, very low impact and not, not really that hard on your body, right? So it's something I think I, I can keep doing for quite a while, I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah, good, excellent. Well, um, anything else you wanted to talk about let me let me see here um so many actually we never can can you show us your new camera mount i did i did want to get back oh. around to that so you have this camera mount that mounts um kind of on your plate the plate underneath the plate mount of the foil and then um it kind of sticks out behind the back of the board so this yeah. i made this plate 
actually I had a, a local machine shop welded up in town on, and this plate sandwiches between the foil and the board on the, on the track mounts. Yeah. Uh, with the Tuttle box, I had to cut this groove to get it to, to fit the Tuttle. Uh, That's so cool. And so it, it hangs off the back of the board. And then at the other end, I have a, a GoPro mount on it with a little little floaty just in case it comes off. And I, I also have the, the Go, GoPro floaty on there. So if I lose the camera, and I've lost a few, um, that's one mount. So that's how you get that follow cam look like it looks like there's a camera following you, like a drone coming right behind you kind of thing. It looks really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's this action right here. This this clip here on. And I can aim the camera up to get the hand work. I can I can mount it taller on. So it it uh, and, it's been good. And you said you tried the the Go uh, the GoPro Max um like the GoPro Max 360, that's the one I've been using a lot. That's like the, um, it has like a 360 lens, but then it takes a lot of work to edit it afterwards, right? So, yes. um, and you said you don't really like using this one that much. So you use just a regular GoPro 8 or 9, you said? Oh, uh, this is the Max. Yeah. And I found that it, it is difficult to use the, the 360. And I found that generally trying to capture things that the regular hero mount or just using one side seems to work. Uh, mm -hmm. The level horizon is really cool. It keeps the horizon level as the board banks. Right. Um, I also have a, a solo shot camera. And this is, you wear this satellite tracker on your body, and then the camera will track you, zoom in, zoom out. And when this works, it's exceptional. I can shoot 120 frames a second, so get slow motion. But so often it thinks I'm over there and it's looking the wrong way. It misses the shot. Yeah, and like your whole, I have like a, I had a love hate relationship with that thing because yeah, like half the time it would work great and the other half of the time it was like nothing. All the whole session I would get was just like water without me in it, <laughs> like where I'm just out of the frame yeah. or something like that. It's I've so got lots of that. I've got lots of that footage, but when it does work, <laughs> it's exceptional. Right. Then I have a regular uh, Sony 4K. I just got this recently. Nice. Uh, but I need someone to film, and my wife has been doing that. I also have the the uh, drone. Uh, it's a. It's a Mavic 2. Mavic 2 Air. Yeah. And this those this are is great. really good, but because so many of the sailing spots are near the airport, I can't fly this. Oh yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, that's kind of my camera gear. So, but you, you said mostly you use uh, just a regular GoPro, um, like a GoPro Hero 8 or 9 with the level, I also, horizon leveling and stuff like that. Yes, I also have the 9 with the hydrophobic lens, which is really good. So many of my shots are ruined because the hydrophobic lens uh, or the, the non hydrophobic lens, particularly that the max, when water gets on it, it kind of ruins the shot. Yeah. So interesting. So that's a good one on the camera gear. So, how often do you come out with a new video? Like, do you try to do it on a regular schedule, or is there like a, um, do you have like a certain uh, I, schedule? I try to try to put one out once a month. Once a month. Um, yeah. And, I'm going to poll my patrons to see what they'd like to see next. I have a few ideas, but I try and get ideas from them. And then when I'm out teaching, when I see a particular pattern where a number of people are having trouble with a certain issue, then I'll try and capture that and, and try and solve that problem. Okay. So as the fastest person on Maui, what are no. some tips for, for going fast on a, on a wing flow board? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not the fastest. I'm, I'm just joking, but as the winner of the race anyway. Uh, well, first one on, last one off. First one on the water, last one off the water. You got to right. put your time in. You know, you're not going to get good thinking about it sitting on the beach. God. Yeah. So that's, that's the biggest tip is just spending a lot of time practicing it. For sure, time out there. You know, yeah. I mean, you can, you can buy speed. You can buy speed. I mean, you can buy the foil. You can buy the board. You can buy the wing. 
all that, but you also have to know how to use it. So yeah. it just takes some time. Yeah, and that part is the, I think the more important part than the equipment. I mean, the equipment is super important, especially at the very high level like where a little bit can make a difference, right? But I think for the average person, it's just about, yeah, the technique and practicing it and to get, get faster, you know, like, yeah, I think that's, that's where you make, that that makes a bigger difference than getting the best and most expensive gear i would say yeah the time and i for the for the racing i practiced every aspect uh, except for the start there was no really way to practice the start but uh there's a few uh buoys anchored here and there up and down the coast and i practiced doing a lot of turns around those buoys i practiced sailing close reach broad reach downwind upwind uh, all trying to go as fast as I can. And then of course, when I'm sailing with Ken and Peter, uh, it's a race upwind. And uh, they they regularly punish me, so. That's good, yeah. man. It's good to have training partners that are faster than you, right? That, yeah. That's another good tip. <laughs> it, we, we take turns beating up on each other though. I, I sometimes yeah. kick their ass and they're it's vice versa. So, and then in, th in th that case where you're all pretty similar is that, like, I guess that's where the, the small differences in the equipment, they're really noticeable, right? Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have someone to train with, you know, and you can adjust this and adjust that and try this and try that and share ideas. And so, and, and you said Ken Winner has the, the one side. So you're using the 600 bullet and he's using the 800. Uh, is that because he's a little bit heavier than you or what, what, why is that one working better for him? Uh, he is a little heavier, uh, but I let him try this setup that the green board with the, the foil recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was blistering fast. And in short order, he got his own 600. <laughs> so yeah, he shares that 600 with his wife, Julie. But, okay. uh, and you can get, I guess, if you're, if you're buying a different, uh, foil size, you have to get that whole one piece construction, front wing, fuselage and tail wing together, right? Yes. And I, you can I only read same mast. You Sorry. can you can mix and match. I believe you can buy separate components. You can buy the the smaller or bigger size foil setup. Yeah. But again, I, I really only recommend it for you know the high end racer. Right. Well, you got me thinking about it, but maybe, I, don't know. I mean, mostly I'm into doing more like freestyle and, and going out in the waves and, and all that, like, cause yeah, the racing can be such an arms race, you know, like, you know, next year that someone else is going to come out with something a little bit faster and everybody buys that and stuff like that. And if you don't have it, then you, you don't really have a chance to, to win. Right. So it's, fr it's frustrating. That's yes. what slalom racing was like too. Yes, I, I have I have a garage full of uh, bones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's definitely fun if you come out on top, right? It's uh, definitely yes. a good feeling. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, at this point, I'm I'm passing the baton. Right. Uh, I'm I'm going to watch from now on. I I highly encourage you to to defend your title next year, but um, oh, I, I'll it sounds probably sounds like you already made made your decision, but oh, well, I'll probably be out there, but I'm not going to yeah. put any pressure on myself. Yeah, it seems like after the Molokai race, I always tell myself I'm not going to do that again. It's like so masochistic, but that, then that the is... next year I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to start training again. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it's kind of a love hate thing too, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, yeah, I really appreciate your time coming on again and uh, super long conversation. Appreciate it and uh, keep going, you know, and, and keep inspiring so many people. It's, I think it's awesome what you do on Patreon. I highly encourage everyone to join that and uh, get all your good tips. And then, of course, also you have the, the great YouTube channel, good videos on YouTube as well. Well, thank but, you. Yeah, but it seems like on the Patreon uh, channel is where you really kind of post your uh, the premium content, right? Right, right. And the whole idea there is, is I'm trying to teach people as if they were having a lesson with me in person. I'm trying to get it across. And it's, it's pretty challenging to do that on, on the video medium, trying to teach a feeling or an experience, but I'm getting better at it. My editing skills are improving and, and working at it. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, congratulations on that, uh, on your success there and, and on 
winning that race and so on. It sounds like you're doing great and um, probably going to hit you up again next year and talk, talk what's new next year. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank All you, right. Robert. So keep it's going. Pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Aloha. Take care. Aloha. See you in the water. Yeah. Okay, Alan, hey. here's some little bonus material. Like we, we kept talking a little bit after I stopped recording and now I'm still has some more props to show us. So one thing that's like your trademark is like the hat, the, the hat you're wearing. So tell us what you're using and how, how it, it works. This is a Tilly Endurable hat. Um, it's a sailor's hat. And I got really badly sunburned down in Australia and started wearing a hat then and came home and found the Tilly. It's guaranteed forever when they wear out, they'll send you a replacement. And this one's got some wear on it. This is my new one. My old one here, this has got about <laughs> 10 years of use on it. And this is, I wear this only in the water. It doesn't go through the wash. I mean, this is, this is a testament to the, the amount of time that I've put in Granted, on the water. Yeah, so, and it, it has a pretty stiff brim. Is that, that what, uh, what you like about it, it? It comes stiff pretty much, but then, yeah. you know, you duck your head and the salt splashes on it, salt water, it dries out yeah. and it's like starch. It, so it gets real stiff after a while. Oh, good, yeah. As long as they don't completely soak it, yeah. which doesn't happen too often. I've been using the shelter hats, which are good too. Like they have that, that kind of the stiff brim that doesn't collapse easily. And that's important when it's windy, especially, you know. Yeah. Something that doesn't and, flop down on your face, right? <laughs> yes. So this one, this one blocks the spray, it blocks the sun. And I and I've had uh, I've had some basal cell cut out of my face a couple mm -hmm. times already. Yeah. Um, so wear your sunscreen, wear the protective gear, wear a hat. Any other props to show us? Oh, I think that's it. Oh. But yeah, hundred percent on the sun, like sun protection. Oh, first place. Yay. First place. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I have to see a dermatologist every four months now and every time she finds some like precancerous stuff and, and uh -huh. I, yeah, either remove it or use the cream stuff. And it's just frustrating. And that's from just spending too much time in the sun when I was young and not not protecting myself enough. You know, so. Yes. So for all those young people watching out there, wear your sunscreen or you're going to pay later. Yeah. And wear long sleeves and protect yourself. Yeah. So. All right. Thanks for sticking around. I really appreciate you listening all the way to the end. Those of you who are still listening, you're the ones I'm making this show for. It's for the hardcore enthusiasts that can't get enough information. I want to say a special thank you to our customers. Blue Planet customers like you make it possible for us to produce these shows for free. All our content is available for free. So by supporting Blue Planet and buying our products, you support shows like this. So thanks again for listening. And the next show is going to be with Adrian Roper from Access Foils. Uh, we're going to talk soon. I just got a new foil set up from him. And I'm super excited to test it out and uh, talk to him about the latest equipment and technology in foil design. So I hope you can listen to that interview as well. Thanks for sticking around once again. See you on the water. Aloha.